All right, let's talk about chapter seven, I believe. Um, this is going to be on marine invertebrates. So this is essentially anything without a backbone, uh, any marine organism without a backbone. So marine inverts uh, belong to the kingdom Animalia. That's the same kingdom that we as humans belong to. Um, majority of, if not all of the marine inverts are heterotrophic. So that means they uh, require, uh, they need to eat in order to get the necessary energy that they need uh, to uh, do ba basic daily stuff like breathing uh, and digestion. Uh, these are animals with no backbone. So that's no f uh, solid physical backbone. So like humans, we have a spinal cord that's made out of calcium carbonate, our bones, and it in, in, uh, encloses our spinal cord, which is a bunch of nerves uh, that runs basically from the base of our skull all the way down to our uh, tailbone. Uh, and so marine invertebrates, they don't have that hard calcium, co uh, calcium carbonate covering to cover their nerve cord. Um, some of them have nerve bundles, but essentially they have just their nerves running all around their body without some sort of hard structure protecting um, that nerve bundle. And uh, of all the animal species um, on earth, 97% of the animal species are invertebrates. So basically majority of the animals that you see within the ocean are invertebrates. So here is a family tree or phy phylogenetic tree of uh, the marine organisms uh, that we will be talking about. And as you can see on this uh, phylogenetic tree, all of the categories at the top, except for the very right category, which is called chordata, all of those phylums are all invertebrates. Chordata is the only one on this tree here that are vertebrates, which means they have a backbone. Everything else does not. All right, so we're going to go through, I think, all of these categories, if not majority of them. But what I want you to take away from this uh, slide is this is how we classify the different organisms into the different phylums. So everything starts off at the common answer, ancestor down at the bottom left-hand corner. And as you go up, you're going to come to a crossroad where you can either go left or right. That's known as a node. Once you get to the node, you have to pick just, you know, just like crossroads, you have to pick... Uh, a direction to go into. So the first one will be tissues or no tissues. If you're a sponge, you have no tissues or no true tissues. We'll talk about that when we get to sponges. If you're everything else, you will choose tissues and you'll go to the right side. They'll go up to the next node and the next one will be symmetry. Do you have radial symmetry or bilateral symmetry? And you'll keep going up until that point at which you uh, come to the very end. So let's just say we're characterizing uh, uh, tenophores, which are comb jellies. That's the third one from the left, up the, the third phylum from the left. And so what you'll do is you'll start at the common ancestor. You'll go up to the first node. Tenophores have tr true tissue, so you'll go to the right, go up to the next one. They have radial symmetry, so you'll go to the left, go up. They have ciliary combs, so you'll go to the right. And then there you go, you get tenophores. Um, you can have some other more complicated ones like echinoderms, echinodermata, which are the third from the right. And you have to follow it all the way up um, to almost the, the last point. And those are basically all of the different characteristics that uh, define that particular phylum. So our, our example for tenophores, they are defined by having true tissues, radial symmetry, and ciliary combs. No other organism within this tree has those specific type of uh, characteristics unless they are tenophores. Okay, so let's talk about each of the uh, major 
phylums. The first one will be sponges, which is phylum porifera. All right, so everything that's a sponge is within this phylum. Sponges are hermaphrodites, so they contain both male and female reproductive organs within their uh, body cavity there. They can produce both sperm and egg, and uh, we'll talk about how they reproduce in a couple of slides. But uh, their cells are specialized cells, and they tend to aggregate together. So unlike ours, which are specialized cells, uh, they their cells work independently from each other. So uh, when we, I'll show you on the next slide, but um, uh, just how those specialized cells work. Um, so because of the segregation of the cells, they don't have true tissues. Because in true tissues, you have to have all of those cells working together uh, for a single purpose. They can't be doing their own independent thing. Um, and majority of the sponges are marine. Um, they are all sessile. You may find one or two species that are freshwater, but majority of them are found in the ocean. So here you can see the images of some sponges. They come in all different shapes, sizes, and colors. Okay. But what's, um, what, what you should know about the structure of a sponge is that they all, no matter what shape or size they are, they will all have an osculum. An osculum is an opening at the very top of the sponge, and that's where the water that is taken into the sponge um, is pumped out of. So they have pores on the side, the pores are also known as ostea, and those pores bring the water in um, using what's known as a collar cell or a coanocyte. That coanocyte has a flagella, a flagellum on it, as you can see uh, in the bottom there, and that flagellum spins, okay, rotates, and because that a uh, flagellum is spinning at a pretty rapid rate, it's creating a current within the sponge. That current causes um, water to be pulled in through the ostea into the, um, the sponge itself, where then the, um, let's see, what is it now? I, th I believe, oh yeah, yeah, okay. So the coanocytes then uh, collect any food particles on top of their uh, their little cilia here next to the flagellum and they process that food and distribute the energy to the other two types of cells. So they have a pore cell which is known as a porocyte or they have um, a wandering cell which is known as an amoebocyte. The amoebocyte is within the tissue of the sponge and their sole purpose is to create spicules. So you can see that little box, blue box in the middle there. Those spicules can be made out of silica or calcium carbonate, um, but those protect um, the sponge as well as provide structure. And the pore cell, it basically what it is, it, it's just a cell that um, creates a pore to bring the water into the sponge. So the water comes in through the porosite and out through the osculum. All right, so uh, sponges are suspension feeders, which means they have to filter their food out of the water, which uh, the porosites do with those little cilia um, on, the, on their cells. Um, the spicules that the amoebocytes create are, uh, are made for structural support as well as for protection. Um, there's not too many organisms that eat sponges, but uh, there are a couple of them. So these uh, spicules help to protect them. They can be salacious or calcareous so and provide structure for uh, the sponge. <clears throat> the other type of material that adds structure is known as spongin, which is a tough elastic a fibrous material that um, the amoebocytes will secrete 
So the amoeba sites will secrete the spongin and the spicules. And if we look at uh, the spicules on the, the top right image there, you can see number one looks like a toothpick. And that type of spicule is created when you have two amoeba sites who come together, secrete whatever material it is, whether it's salacious or calcareous, and they will spread apart to the very end until they get to a certain point. They let go and they've created your toothpick like spicule. Uh, number two, uh, spicule that looks like a Mercedes Benz logo without the circle around it. Um, that is created with three amoeba sites. They all start in the middle and work their way outwards until they get to that shape. So you can imagine number six that looks like a giant star. Uh, imagine how many amoeba sites would, it would take. Uh, to create that particular spicule. So now so, uh, reproduction of sponge uh, primarily occurs as asexual reproduction. So they will bud, they will do budding, and they'll uh, create a clone of themselves, and it'll be a smaller, uh, a, a smaller clone of themselves that buds off of the main one. And then once it uh, is fully developed, it will break off, uh, separate itself from the main sponge and then drift a bit until it finds a suit suitable spot where then it will settle and uh, turn into a large sponge. Uh, but they do sexual reproduction uh, at times uh, throughout the year and uh, the they they have a specialized egg cell and a specialized a sperm cell and that specialized sperm cell is a modified collar cell or uh, coanocyte and it turns into a spore cell goes and um, is released into uh, the water column so these are broadcast spawners and it will fertilize an egg of not the same species there's a sp specific um, receptors on both the egg and the sperm that prevent fertilization of sperm and uh, of eggs from the same uh, organism. <clears throat> then um, it gets fertilized and attaches itself to the side of the wall, uh, becomes an embryo, is released into the water column, or yeah, and, um, and then uh, turns into a new sponge, settles, and becomes an adult sponge. So let's see, what is this? So the the fertilization occurs within the sponge, all right. Um, that egg cell is attached there. A neighboring sponge's sperm gets pulled in through the pore, fertilizes the egg. The egg turns into an embryo, which then turns into a larvae, and that larvae gets pushed out into the open ocean through the osculum and when it finds a, a suitable habitat to settle on it will metamorph settle it will settle and it will metamorphose into an adult a small adult uh, if it touches down and it's not favorable conditions there is a chance that the larvae will uh, not settle and not metamorphose but it'll bounce back up and try to find a more suitable habitat. Okay, so that was sponges. Now let's talk about cnidarians. Um, cnidarians are your jellyfishes, but they are also your corals and sea anemones. Uh, cnidarians are, are characterized by having a radial symmetry. Uh, just as an FYI, uh, coral, uh, not corals, uh, sponges that we just talked about do not have any symmetry. Uh, they are what's known as asymmetrical. So they um, cannot be split into equal parts. Uh, that vase-like uh, sponge that you saw as an example can be split um, in half and may look identical, but theoretically speaking, a sponge can... Uh, have all different shapes and sizes 
So that's the reason why they are, they are characterized as having asymmetry or no symmetry. Whereas the Cnidarians, they have radial symmetry. So radial symmetry means they can be cut um, as many different times as needed and all parts will look exactly the same. So for instance, if you equate that to cutting your uh, pizza, so let's just say you, uh, you got a pizza and it was delivered and you opened it up and it was cut into eight equal slices, right? And they all look in, like that pie shape. Well, that's the same thing. A jellyfish can be split into, let's say, eight, eight equal uh, slices and all of them will look identical. Um, so that's that's essentially what radial symmetry uh, means. And uh, they have what's known as oral and aboral surfaces. So there's only two surfaces to uh, uh, cnidarians. The oral surface, as it would suggest, is where their mouth is located at, uh, depending on whether you're a jellyfish. Uh, jellyfish have the oral side facing down, uh, and their aboral side is facing up. So the aboral side is where they don't have a mouth, basically. Um, if you're a uh, sea anemone or a coral, uh, your mouth is going to be facing up, and your aboral surface is going to be facing down. I'll show you that in a little bit. Um, but their phylum is known as cnidaria, right? And the main, the three main ones are jellyfishes, sea anemones, and corals in this category. So the structure to a cnidarian is as follows. Uh, a polyp, which is on the left-hand side, uh, is uh, basically like your coral polyp or your sea anemone. Your mouth is on top, so that's your oral surface. Your aboral surface is completely opposite, so it's at the bottom of the body stalk, and that's what they use to attach to the rock or the coral head. Okay, uh, polyps have tentacles, a gastrovascular cavity where they digest their food. They have a gastrodermis, epidermis, mesoglea, the, all, all different tissues. Um, but for a polyp, the tentacle is at the top near uh, the mouth. Versus a medusa, which is your jellyfish. A medusa looks like a polyp, but just upside down. So their aboral surface is on the top. Their oral surface is on the bottom, where their mouth is at. Their tentacles surround their mouth, and they also have an epidermis mesoglea and gastrodermis. And they also have a gastrovascular uh, cavity. Right? So... That's, those are the main um, parts to cnidarians. Uh, interestingly enough, cnidarians, um, while, while sponges do not have a nervous system, uh, uh, jellyfish have a very simple nervous system. Uh, they do not have a brain, but they do have what's known as a nervous net, and that allows them to be able to sense things within the water. So for instance, if you touch a jellyfish, they know that they have been touched. They don't know if it hurt. They don't know if it was good or bad, but they just know that something touched them. Okay. All right, so types of cnidarians that you'll find within the ocean. You have these five types right here. You have hydrozoans, siphonophores, scyphozoans, Cube, cubo medusae and anthozoans. All right, so we'll look at each one separately. So hydrozoans um, are feather-like colonies of polyps. They um, they live majority of their life as polyps, but only when they do reproduction do they uh, switch over into the medusa phase and create a zygote, which then turns into a larva, which known as, which is known as a planula. And that planula settles and tries to find suitable habitat. So when I say suitable habitat, 
I mean that there's enough nutrients, there's enough water flow within that area, and that there's no other living organism there, so that they can um, settle, have enough nutrients, and have enough oxygen in order to survive. And they will grow up um, into adults. And so those adults uh, live on uh, stalks, right? They have little stalks. Um, and they are, they, they have little, little homes that they can pull themselves into and they can let their tentacles out and feed. Okay. So there's an image on the top right hand corner that go over there. Next you have, uh, siphonophores, siphonophores, which are better known as Portuguese man of war. Um, as you guys should all be familiar with here in Hawaii, um, when, you have a full moon every month, and 10 days after that full moon, you generally get the warning on the news station saying, okay, don't go into the ocean because there's jellyfish. Well, gen generally you'll either see uh, box jelly or you'll see uh, Portuguese man of war. Portuguese man of war is that image on the left-hand side on the bottom there. Um, and what's really interesting about these siphonophores is unlike the uh, hydrozoans and the other jellyfish that we'll be talking about um, in this category, siphonophores have specialized cells. So they have three different types of cells and each of them do their own um, individual thing. So for instance, those tentacles on those siphonophores are... Um, uh, What's the word? Oh my goshness, my brain just blanked. Um, those are the nematocysts. There we go, that's the word I was thinking of. Um, those are the stinging cells and they're found in the tentacles. Uh, and then that gas float on the top of that Portuguese man -war, that's another type of cell. And its sole purpose is just to act as a float so that it keeps it at the surface. And then they also have uh, reproductive cells and their sole purpose is just to reproduce. So uh, while it looks like one individual, each cell uh, can act independently from the other. So essentially siphonophores are just a group, uh, it, it's like a colony of cells, basically. Um, but so apparently these are hydrozones that form drifting colonies of polyps. Okay, that's straight from your textbook, but essentially it's just a number of cells that have gotten together to uh, achieve their main goal, which is to survive, basically. Um, but they all can act, all of the cells can act independently from each other. So if you've ever heard of nematocysts, um, well, say a jellyfish, uh, how do you say, gets washed up onto shore and uh you walk up to it and you're like, oh, it's a dead jellyfish. It can't hurt me. And so you decide to pick it up to inspect it. Well, uh, FYI, you should not be picking up jellyfish, even if they look dead, because those nematocysts are still active. They don't die uh, when the larger organism dies. Those nematocysts will keep stinging uh, even when the organism passes away. So uh, don't go touching jellyfish. Hey, 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 let go of the computer. No, no. Okay. All right. So those were siphonophores. Uh, a lot of uh, Portuguese man of war are the main ones that occur at the surface. Uh, but that image on the right hand side there is an image of a siphonophore that is found in the deep ocean. So you can find them pretty much everywhere in the ocean. Uh, Skyphozoans are your uh, large jellyfish. So you're, uh, whenever you think of a jellyfish, it's most likely going to be a siphonophore unless it's a box jelly which we will talk about uh, in the next slide. Um, uh, these types of jellyfish have what's known as a bell, bell-shaped medusa so that they have a very prominent looking um, medusa which is that round cap looking thing, mushroom cap, and generally they can get um, they can be as big as three meters across, so uh, pretty big. They, they, not all of them are that big, but they can get up to that size. Uh, they 
most jellyfish uh, have limited swimming ability, so they can swim, um, but not against a current. Uh, generally, they will use currents to get them from place to place, and they can limited, limitedly swim within a given region by pulsating their medusa. So on the right hand image there, you can see uh, just the different characteristics of uh, a Skyphozoan. And you can see they have tentacles, they have um, stinging uh, oral arms with stinging cells on them. That's what they use to capture their prey. Um, they have, uh, Skyphozoans also have eyes by the way. Um, I don't know if you can tell. But on the image on the left-hand side there, at each node uh, around the, the cap there, there should be an eye. Um, it's a little hard to see, but uh, I, don't, I don't think the, the anatomy picture shows it. But they generally have a gut, some gonads, a mouth, the bell cap. Uh, those canals that they're talking about is that nervous net. Uh, and they do have a muscle ring which allows them to pulsate so that they can uh, swim a short distance. All right, next is your cubozoans. Uh, these are your box jellies. Um, they can have anywhere from four tentacles up to however many you see in this image right here. Um, and they can have as many as 24 eyes. And these eyes, unlike the other uh, Skyphozoans, can actually produce images. So this is where you start to see very primitive eyes um, forming in organisms. Um, and in this case, the eyes, the, the box jellies use their eyes to actively hunt their prey. So these, these particular jellyfish are pretty nasty, um, as well as poisonous. Uh, not all um, species of box jellies are deadly to humans, but definitely the ones in Australia are definitely deadly. Um, so if, I would definitely heed the warnings in Australia if you plan on going swimming, especially uh, at around the time when they are coming on shore. Uh, but as you can see here, they have a very uh, typical a box shape to their medusa. Uh, they tend to have a ton of uh, tentacles. Uh, again, it depends on the species. Some of them only have four. As, uh, some of them have multiple, like this one does. Um, and they all have their typical gonads, mouth, aboral, and oral side uh, to them. All right, and lastly, you have your uh, anthozoans. Your anthozoans are your corals, right, and your sea anemones. So all of those are within this uh, category right here. They can be uh, solitary or colony polyps. So um, many of the corals are colonies of polyps uh, that live on top of that skeletal structure. Uh, the image on the right-hand bottom side there is a, an image of a mushroom coral. Uh, this particular coral is a single polyp, uh, so it's very unusual for corals to be single polyps, but this one um, some, has somehow managed to do it. Um, but corals lack the medusa stage, so while all the other um, jellyfish and uh, the hydrozoans, they tend to have a medusa stage, anthozoans do not, uh, so they stay in the polyp phase for their entire life. All right, so some biology on cnidarians. Uh, all cnidarians are carnivores, so they have to hunt for their prey um, to get the energy that they need. Uh, corals are the exception because they do have um, uh, zooxanthellae that help them uh, photosynthesize and produce energy, but they also still hunt for any extra uh, nutrients that they need. Uh, all, almost all of them have nematocysts that can sting and capture prey. Um, I think the exception is corals. I do not think corals have 
uh, nematocysts, but er all the other ones, even sea anemones, uh, have nematocysts that can sting. Digestion occurs outside of the gastrovascular uh, cavity. Um, and it starts with uh, a secretion of digestive enzymes. And then once the process start, once that food starts to break down, it gets uh, taken into the gut where then um, it continues to further be digested. Uh, Nidarians do not have a brain, like I mentioned earlier, uh, but they do have a nervous system, which is known as a nervous net. So again, they, they know that you touch them, but they don't know if it hurt. They don't know if they liked it or not. Uh, they don't know any of that, but that helps them because then they know, oh, I bumped into my neighbor. Whoops, sorry. Um, stuff like that, basically. Uh, they also use that nervous net as a way of identifying uh, their fellow neighbors. So the way that majority of the jellyfish reproduce is um, by stacking the polyps on top of each other. So they start off as a, they go into a polyp phase, then they will clone themselves and stack them on top of each other. And then um, as they become mature, they will pop off, turn upside down and become a, a Medusa. Uh, go into the Medusa phase and become a small jellyfish. Um, and all of those a jellyfish that were on the same polyp have a specific receptor. Uh, and when they touch each other, they know uh, by that receptor that, oh, hey, that's Bob. I know Bob. Um, but if they run into a jellyfish that doesn't have that same receptor, uh, then they're like, oh, I don't know who you are. Okay, let me attack you. And that's what they end up doing is they end up attacking. And uh, some species will end up uh, eating that other jellyfish uh, because just because they don't know each other. Uh, so that, that was an in interesting tidbit for you guys. Um, oh, yeah, there you go. The specialized nematocysts. That, that's what they use. Um, and then they also have statocytes, which are small calcareous bodies um, that are used for balance. So they know when they're upside down. And then, um, so when you see them in the aquariums and whatnot, and they're just going around in a circle in a circle, these statocytes are used to help them uh, indicate whether they're upside down, right side up, whether they're going left or whether they're going right. So... It's a, it's, it's a handy, uh, um, I guess, thing t for them to use. It's much like our inner ear uh, in humans. Okay, so that was cnidarians. So now let's talk about uh, tenophores. Tenophores are what's known as comb jellies. And technically speaking, our comb jellies come before jellyfish within the phylogenetic tree. I know what I showed you uh, has them after uh, jellyfish, but recent genetic studies have shown that they are actually um, a little bit more simple than jellyfish. So when you look at the phylogenetic tree, it should be sponges, tenophores, and then jellyfish. But your textbook is a little old school, so it puts uh, tenophores afterwards. Um, but tenophores, uh, generally speaking, are deep water species. Um, they are all marine. You won't find any in freshwater. And they also have radial symmetry. So you can um, split them into as many equal parts as you can, and they will all be identical. Uh, they have, they don't have nematocysts. They have, uh, they have what's known as a, I forget what they're called, but they're sticky cells. Oh, I think I talk about it in the next slide. Um, but they have what's known as ciliary combs. So they don't have tentacles. Um, they have these eight ciliary combs uh, found around their body. And they uh, 
uh, swish them back and forth, and that helps them move around in the ocean. Those ciliary uh, reflect light uh, when you hit them with white light, okay? But because majority of them are found in the deep ocean, you don't normally see this rainbow effect uh, in the deep ocean. Uh, generally speaking, the only time you can get it is when you're shining uh, a white light at them. So you can click on that uh, YouTube link to watch a video about how they, um, how those ciliary combs look like a rainbow when you shine light at them. So the structure of a tina four uh, are uh, looks like this on the right hand side there. You can see the two in this particular example they have two main tentacles with sticky cells uh, on them that are known as clo co coloblasts and that's what they use to capture their prey. So they don't use nematocysts like um, tinafores do. They, uh, not tinafores, I'm sorry, cnidarians. Uh, they use these coloblasts. Uh, they do, some species do have nematocysts, but majority of them uh, rely on the coloblasts. And uh, tinafores are uh, carnivores, and they have uh, pretty big appetites, so they need to eat quite a bit. So as you can see on the image on the right-hand side there, you can see the, the ciliary and the comb plates. Uh, you can see where the tentacle, tentacles come out. Um, they do have a, a mouth and an anus, so um, they don't have an oral and aboral sides like the, the cnidarians do. Uh, these guys have a mouth and they do have an anus, and the anus does, um, they do poop out of their anus. They have a stomach, they do have a nervous net, uh, so they do know that they were touched, they just don't know if they liked it or not, so they don't have any brains. Okay, so let's look at the difference between bilateral and lateral, uh, bilateral and radial symmetry. Uh, the first one there uh, is your beetle. Your beetle there has bilateral symmetry because it can only be cut in half. So you can only have two equal parts that are identical to each other. Um, and they have a posterior and anterior side. They also have a dorsal and a ventral side. So your dorsal will be the top view that we're seeing right there. Your ventral side will be the bottom. Your uh, anterior will be the mouth side and your posterior will be the butt side. Okay, so humans also have bilateral symmetry. Uh, so I guess you can take a guess uh, which one all of our different sides are. Uh, the coral polyp there has radial symmetry. And as you can see, it can be cut into uh, many different equal parts. So that particular one just shows six uh, equal parts, but you can cut into eight, ten. I mean, you name it. It can be it can be sliced. Um, and they also have oral and aboral uh, surfaces to themselves. And then lastly, your sponge. Your sponge has uh, no symmetry, so it's known as asymmetry. The A uh, is a prefix meaning no or none. And um, basically your sponge has, it doesn't have a, a different side. It just, all the diff all the sides are different. Uh, it doesn't matter which side you're looking at. All right, so those, that was your tinafores. So let's talk about worms. And so this is uh, your phylum Annelida. Um, and worms are pretty much everywhere in the ocean. Uh, here are your different categories. You've got flatworms, ribbon worms, nematodes, arrow worms, segmented worms, and peanut worms. All right, so let's talk about each one. Flatworms are very pretty. Uh, they have um, all different colors, all different shapes. Um, all different frilliness to them, as you see on the bottom left-hand image right there. Uh, but they do not contain a body cavity. So when I say body cavity, I mean, look at look at your body. Where do all of your organs sit at, right? There's a portion of your body that if you were to take all of your organs out, 
you would be left with an empty cavity, right? So your organs as a human sits within that body cavity. Uh, these flatworms though don't, I mean, they're flat. When you look at them, uh, they don't have space for body cavity. So all of their organs um, are basically squished to within their body. Um, these are the simplest organisms that have real organs and organ systems. So up until this point, the sponges, the cnidarians, and the tenophores did not have organ systems or real organs aside from your stomach and your gonads. But those are not organ systems. So in this case here, flatworms, majority of the worms have what's known as like a complete digestive system or a complete respiratory system. That's that's what I mean by an organ system. Whereas your jellyfish had a, a stomach or gut. It didn't have the intestines and didn't have the colon and you know all those other things that go along with a digestive system. Um, this is the first organism within the phylogenetic tree that you can see has a central nervous system and they do have a simple brain. So it's not as complex like ours, but it is still classified as a brain. Um, so they know that they were touched and they uh, probably will know that they don't like it. Uh, so uh, that's the difference between them and jellyfish. Uh, their mesoderm, um, which if you remember from the jellyfish is the tissue found in between the epidermis and the, uh, I forget what the inner, inner tissue is, but it's in between the two different uh, dermis tissues. And they, the mesoderm becomes mus muscle tissues, re the reproductive system, and other uh, organs. Okay. So the types of flatworms that you can have, you can have tubularians. Um, which are free living carnivores in the ocean. So they just kind of crawl around on the bottom of the ocean uh, and uh, feed off of whatever they can find. You can have flukes, um, which are uh, very long, or no, no, no. Flukes are marine parasites that live on the side of fish um, and other marine organisms. So that fish down there has fluke so I don't know if you can see but it has like white white dots on its fins those are the flukes and then you can have tapeworm tapeworm is also parasitic and lives within the intestines of an organism and attaches to the intestines walls and so it feeds off of the um, the food that's in the intestines so yeah, it's, it, it's not a pretty sight. They can get pretty long, too. Next, we have ribbon worms. Ribbon worms uh, have a complete digestive tract. They also have a reduced body cavity. So they have a slight body cavity, unlike the ribbon worms, or um, the flat worms. And they have a circulatory system, so a very uh, a small one. Um, they have what's known as a proboscis, which is um, that white branch looking uh, thing in the image below that extends out of their mouth uh, and extends outward. And so anything that can they can eat will get stuck to the proboscis and then brought back in and digested. Yep. Uh, so you can see that white thing extending out. Uh, it is sticky and it's, you can't really call it a tongue per se, but it's like a tongue in the sense that it sticks out, gathers food, and then um, is retracted back in. Uh, next you have nematodes. Nematodes are also known as round worms because when you look at their body, uh, they are round. Uh, they generally live in sediments or other organisms. Uh, they can be parasitic. And um, 
they feed on bacteria when they are in the uh, sediment. Uh, but if they're if they're in your in your body in humans, uh, they are feeding off of the bacteria within your body. And so kind of scary. Um, they do have a body cavity because they they are round, and they use hydrostatic pressure to hold their shape. So um, essentially, what they're doing is they're pumping water into their body, and that's giving them that that round shape to them themselves. And if you take them out of the water, uh, they lose that round shapeness to their body. Uh, so they use the water to keep themselves uh, round, basically. And then lastly, you have arrowworms. Arrowworms are also known as kita gnats. Uh, they are interesting in the sense that they don't really look like worms. They look more fish-like in the sense that they have fins and a tail. Oh, a blue. Um, so if you can see that head on the right-hand side there, it looks like it has whiskers. Uh, and they use that, those whiskers to feel for vibrations. They do have eyes, um, and they also use those whiskers to grab their their food and bring it towards their mouth, which is in the center of that image right there. Um, they are ambush predators, which means they kind of lie in wait until prey comes by, and then they jolt out, grab it, and devour it before it can escape. Okay, so on the bottom image there, you can kind of see the tail, which is... Uh, on the left side of the image there. Um, it's clear, it looks like it has an outline to it. And then they also have the fins um, at the top and the bottom there. Uh, seg seg oh, segmented worms, that is your uh, phylum. They are in the phylum an Analyta. Their body is segmented. So all of the worms that we've seen so far do not have segments to their body but this image right here of an earthworm you can see the different segments in its body okay um so they have uh segmented worms are really interesting you can see the uh different uh uh different body parts that they have they do have a brain they have a mouth they have a, a number of hearts uh they have a digestive tract and what's really interesting is they use longitudinal muscles and circular muscles to uh, allow them to move around. So those longitudinal muscles uh, move back and forth and let them uh, let lets the worm extend. Uh, it, it contracts and it, it extends the muscles, and then those circulatory ones uh, contract in a circular motion to allow for um, uh, a concert of movement forward from for the earthworm. So the type of segmented worms that you'll see are polychaetes, beard worms, leeches, and echurins. So let's talk about each one. Polychaetes are probably the largest category of segmented worms within the ocean. Uh, they have what's known as a parapoda, parapodia um, with setae um, on it. So essentially parapodia are just feet. Um, that's what it translates to. And if you can see on the bottom middle image there, that is an image of a fireworm. FYI, if you see this critter in the ocean, do not touch him. He is highly poisonous. He won't kill you, but it will hurt like hell if you touch him. So each parapodia on that fireworm right there has those fine white bristle looking things. Those are the seti. Those seti uh, are very fine, almost glass like uh, structures. And um, what happens is if you touch that fireworm, those seti get stuck within your skin and irritate your skin. So it creates a really bad rash. Uh, wherever the fireworm touches. So if you step on this guy, that's really bad. <laughs> uh, that's going to hurt. Um, or if you pick him up, that's going to hurt as well, too. Um, polychaetes have gills. 
and the capillaries on their gills allow for absorption of oxygen. Um, so that's how they get their oxygen. And uh, they are either carnivorous or suspension feeders. So that fireworm is a carnivorous uh, polychaete. Um, but the two on either side, the Christmas tree worm and the feather duster worm, uh, they are segmented. The segment part of their body is within the tube itself. And what you see is the, uh, the tentacles, basically, or the gills, I should say. And um, they do suspension feeding, so they have to allow the particles to brush over their gills and it's collected and then brought into their digestive system to be um, broken down. Uh, beard worms uh, are only found in the deep ocean around hydrothermal vents. Uh, that's an image of them right there. They are uh, endemic to hydrothermal vents, so you don't see them anywhere else within the ocean. They do not have a mouth or a gut uh, because they use uh, symbiotic bacteria, much like corals, uh, to produce all of the energy needed for the worm. So they don't need to digest any, um, any nutrients. They can absorb any additional nutrients through their tentacles. So that red, uh, you can kind of think of them, they kind of look like lipstick almost. So that reddish area is their tentacle and they, they can absorb nutrients through that area right there. Their gills are also found right there. Um, the symbiotic bacteria that they use, since they are only found within the deep ocean, they cannot use photosynthesis because there's no sunlight in the deep ocean. So they do chemosynthesis and use sulfur, that uh, hydrogen sulfide, or hydrogen hydrogen sulfide that is um, released from the hydro hydrothermal vent to produce uh, uh, glucose for them. Leeches are um, fresh, mainly freshwater species, uh, but you do have some that are in the, the ocean. And as you can see there, they have um, specialized suckers. They do not have parapodia like polychaetes do. Um, and one sucker is where the jaws are actually at. And then they have a posterior sucker that allows them to hang on. So just think about this, they, they're always attached to an organism. So if you're only attached by the mouth side, um, if that organism swishes back and forth um, and they don't have that posterior sucker, then they will um, quickly be dislodged from, from that organism that they're trying to feed off of. Uh, they are, in a sense, parasitic because they do uh, rely on another organism to get their food. So in this case, they're, they're drinking the blood from other organisms. And um, yeah, and you can see that they have very fine segments on their body. Lastly, you have Ecurans. Um, so even though they are uh, listed under segmented worms, their body themselves are not segmented, as you can tell. Uh, they're also known as peanut worms. Uh, I can tell you something else that they look like, but that would be inappropriate. I'm sure you guys all uh, have have that thought as well, too. Uh, they have a proboscis. So in that image on the bottom um, there, that yellow uh, frilly object on the right-hand side is their proboscis and they cannot retract that proboscis back into their mouth. So it always stays out um, and it is always collecting food. They are deposit feeders. So deposit feeders uh, are different from suspension, suspension feeders in the sense that they uh, get their food from whatever's on the bottom of the ocean floor. So they are, um, they live, uh, they are known as benthic organisms. So they live on the bottom. And that's where, that's where they get uh, their stuff from, or their food. Uh, peanut worms are similar to uh, Ecurans, but 
Um, well, they're they're basically the same. They 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 look. Oh no, that is that is a peanut worm. Oh yeah, yeah, that's what I said. Um, but the organism on the right hand side there is also a peanut worm, um, and they live in shallow, um, shallow shallow uh, waters. So the, you you won't find these guys in the in the deep ocean. All right. Let's see. All right, so that was it for worms. So that was your phylum Annelida. Next, we're going to be talking about mollusk, which is your phylum uh, gast gastropoda. Okay, all right, we've got a fussy baby here. All right, so mollusks are uh, probably the most successful organism within the ocean because they you can find a mollusk just about anywhere within the ocean. Okay, they have uh, adapted to all parts of the ocean, including the deep ocean. Right. Uh, so we will talk about that. We will talk about the different types uh, in following slides. Uh, but their body is unsegmented, so they don't have segments like the uh, like the worms do. And typically, uh, their body is enclosed by some sort of calcium carbonate shell. All right. So you can see that snail. Um, down in the bottom image right there, it has its shell that it's covering its soft body. Otherwise, um, it would have no way of protecting itself. Um, all mollusks have a very similar body plan, but slightly different arrangements. So that body plan that you see right there, all, all mollusks ha have that. It's just, is it in the same spot? And usually the case is no. So the type of mollusk that you'll find within the ocean are gastropods, bivalves, cephalopods, and some other different types of mollusk that are mentioned within your textbook. So let's talk about each one. Your gastropods, uh, these are the most common and the largest category of uh, mollusk that you'll find. I'm sorry, the phylum is not gastropoda. The phylum is known as mollusca. Um, and in this particular, uh, I think this one would be class. It would be class gastropoda. You have um, snails, limpets, ab abalones, and nudibranchs. So limpets, I mean, we all know what snails look like, right? That's the image on the right-hand side there. Limpets, on the other hand, uh, are you guys familiar with opihi here in Hawaii? If you guys are, if you have ever eaten them before, you are eating limpets, all right? So that's your image on the left-hand side there. Abalone are also limp, uh, not limpets, but uh, gastropods, uh, and nudibranchs. Nudibranchs are the image on the bottom middle there, the very colorful, almost uh, snail-looking image, except there's no shell on top of them. Uh, so... Uh, I think we will talk about that. Yes, we will. Um, all, all gastropods use what's known as a radula to scrape algae off of the rocks. So a radula, you can think of it as like a tongue almost, but it's really hard. And it's used to scrape the algae so that they can eat it. All right. Nudibranchs are very special because they are gastropods that do not have shells. All the other gastropods have some sort of shell, um, but uh, through evolution, they have lost it. Uh, they tend to be very colorful, and like every, anything else that's in the ocean, if it's colorful, it's gonna be poisonous, all right? So they do produce toxins, um, and, uh, and some species can even uh, uh, incorporate nematocysts uh, into their structure to to help protect themselves because they don't have a shell to protect them anymore. Uh, nudibranchs tend to uh, eat sponges. So again, one of the only, uh, one of the few species that actually preys upon sponges. Hydroids, which are those uh, coral, uh, not corals, but um, and cnidarians and other invertebrates that they can get their hands on. So if you see a nudibranch, uh, I w it would probably be safe to say not to touch them, 
They are very pretty though, but they could sting you or, um, uh, it could be, uh, it could release a toxin that could create a rash on you. Uh, next we have bivalves, uh, bivalves as it suggests by their name. They have two shells that come together at a hinge. Um, and they open, they open at the other side, opposite of the hinge. So you can see uh, in the examples here, we've got our giant clam on the left-hand side there. That giant clam can open and close its shell. Uh, and then on the uh, right-hand side there is a scallop. Uh, what I want you to pay attention to this scallop, um, if you notice those black dots on the white muscle part of that scallop, those black dots are eyes. Okay, so some of these um, gastropods, not gastropods, uh, some of these mollusks, I should say, um, they can have eye structures, and the, and um, they're not very complex eyes. They uh, they detect differences in light, so they are light sensitive. So if a shadow goes over them, you'll be sure to uh, they will they will quickly close themselves up to protect themselves. Um, their gills are used not only to get oxygen, but to get food particles from the water. So they are filter feeders. Uh, major uh, so almost all of them are filter feeders. Uh, some of them, like this giant clam here, um, is not only a filter feeder, but it also relies on zooxanthellae uh, or a symbiotic algae to uh, produce uh, energy for for itself, okay, uh, via photosynthesis. Additionally, these mollusks I burrow into uh, either the sand or attach themselves to the rocks using abyssal threads. So these are just very fine filaments that um, attach to the rocks and prevent uh, that mollusk from getting swept away in the currents or the waves. But that giant clam there, he'll just burrow himself um, into the sand there. And that scallop definitely will burrow and hide itself uh, in the sand. Uh, next you have cephalopods. Uh, these are uh, your octopus and your squid and your cuttlefishes. Um, the, the, this category is very smart. Uh, as you guys may well know, uh, octopus are very, very smart creatures. Uh, they are very agile swimmers and have complex nervous systems. Uh, so they are a little bit more advanced than their counterparts um, within this phylum. Uh, they either have a reduction in their shell or they have lost their shell completely. Um, so for instance, the octopus there. That is a blue ring octopus in the middle uh, on the right hand side there. This particular octopus is very toxic uh, and if it stings you, you will die even here in Hawaii. So if you see an octopus like this, steer well clear of this organism because um, you definitely don't want to get stung by it. Uh, but that octopus there does not have a shell at all. Um, it has lost uh, all of its, any remnants of its shell. Uh, that squid uh, down below the octopus, um, that squid has a reduced shell, um, and it's not an external shell. It's, um, it's a piece of a shell that's found within the head part there, and it's known as the pen. And so the reason why it's called a pen is because back in the day they used to use that for writing uh, so they would dip it in ink they would you know put a point on it uh, dip it in ink and start writing with it so that's the reason why it's called a pen um, that nautilus up at the top there uh, that is the only one in this category who has not lost his shell uh, he still has a shell uh, as you can see and he does have a uh, I forget what it's called but like a cap so he can suck himself back into a shell, cover the opening with that cap, and protect himself. Um, but they essentially use a siphon, which uh, you can see on the octopus there. It's that hole 
um, at the base of the head and they suck water in and they um, uh, force it out of, a, of another, um, uh, I don't know, pore or hole underneath near their mouth um, and that propels them through the water. So they can do they can do that, or they can uh, walk on their feet or or their tentacles, um, or and, and they can fit into pretty uh, tight spaces, and that's primarily for the octopus. Cuttlefish typically will not walk around on their tentacles, and uh, definitely the nautilus will not do that. Um, some species of cephalopods have ink sacs, and so they can uh, ink you basically. So those are your octopus and your squids. I don't think Nautilus have ink. I could be wrong, actually. They may have ink. Uh, but, all right, so those are your cephalopods. Um, so if mollusk, how they feed, they uh, will have a separate mouth and a separate anus. So unlike jellyfish, which I may have forgotten to mention, jellyfish eat through the same hole and they also poop through the same hole, um, but uh, mollusks are very different. Uh, they have they have a separate mouth and a separate butt, basically. Um, let's see, they do have salivary and digestive glands, and so uh, they that sal those salivary glands can start the digestion outside of the body, and then those digestive glands, uh, which are in uh, near the stomach can further digest the food uh, once it's brought into uh, the body. Um, they do have an open circulatory system um, except cephalopods which have a closed circu circulatory system. So humans have a closed circu circulatory system which means all of, all of their blood and oxygen um, stays within our body for the most part, as long as we don't get hurt. Um, mollusks, uh, other types of mollusks will have a open circulatory system. So that means it has some sort of connection with its surrounding, uh, its surroundings. Uh, in this particular, uh, example here, uh, the image on the right hand side, you can see this is a, 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 a description of the different parts of a cuttlefish. And you can see uh, that internal shell all the way to the right there, that is what is known as the pen. Um, you can see uh, different parts of it. The, they have the mantle, which is basically just the, uh, the tissue on the outside. Um, you have your reproductive organ, your heart. They, they have multiple hearts, okay? Well, in this case, they have two hearts. They have the main heart and the accessory heart. Uh, they have a gill, they have an ink sac, their anus, a siphon, a radula. A radula, remember from limpets, is used to, limpets use it to scrape algae off of the, the rocks. Well, in this case, the radula is used to um, break apart their food. Um, and let's see, what else do they have here? They have an esophagus and a stomach. So they have a complete um, digestive system and a complete um, respiratory system. All right, so the nervous system for mollusks are, um, they, they have, some species have brains. So for instance, they are octopus. All, almost all of them have brains. And as you can tell, they're very smart. Uh, they can, uh, they get bored basically in aquarium. So oftentimes you'll see videos of them escaping their aquarium habitat uh, to go back into the wild which is why um, a lot of aquariums have to come up with clever ways to feed them, to keep them entertained. Um, so one example is at the Waikiki Aquarium, the octopus that they have there. Uh, they will put the food for the octopus within a jar. And uh, that octopus then has to figure out that he has to open up the jar in order to get his food. Well, he does it quite regularly um, and with a, a very good skill. Um, but other mollusks will have what's known as a ganglia or a cluster of nerve cells um, for their brains. So it's basically like early 
like early stages of our brain where you just have like a bunch of nerve cells or uh, nerve uh, bundles or clusters um, that function very similar similarly to a brain and um, cephalopods uh, obviously have the most complex nervous system um, out of all of the mollusks uh, reproductive systems for mollusks. Uh, some species are hermaphrodites, which means they have both male and female organs. Uh, male cephalopods have a specialized arm. So out of their eight arms, so the octopus now, uh, out of their eight arms, one of them is known as a spermatophore, and it can inject sperm into the female. Um, and interestingly enough, they uh, primarily in cuttlefish, you'll see this, um, but uh, they have this thing where uh, they have what's known as sneaker males. And so these sneaker males are smaller males uh, who are trying to uh, reproduce with females, uh, but they get outcompeted by the larger ones. So what they'll do is they'll, they'll find a female and they'll just kind of wait off to the side. And then once a male, a larger male comes by, uh, he will copulate with the female and inject his sperm uh, using his spermatophore. And then once he leaves, the smaller one comes, uh, comes out, uh, does his whole dance thing with uh, the female he will then go in, insert his spermatophore into, uh, into the female. He will scoop out all of the previous larger male sperm and insert his own into the female. So this is one way in which these smaller males have adapted to procreating. Otherwise, in a lot of other species, the smaller males uh, don't usually get to uh, procreate until they get much larger. Okay, so that was it for mollusks. Now let's talk about arthropods. So this is your phylum arthropoda. Uh, this is by far the largest uh, phylum of animals on earth. So um, mollusks are uh, a pretty decently large phylum for the ocean. But when you look at the earth overall, arthrop arthropods are the most abundant. Um, Arthropods are also uh, also are crustaceans, so all of your crabs and your lobsters and your shrimps and your spiders and your insects, all of those organisms are within this phylum here. They do have segmented body plans and they are bilateral symmetry, so the same thing as humans. Um, but what's different is arthropods tend to have an exoskeleton, so they have their hard shell on the outside, whereas humans, we have our skeleton on the inside. So we have an endoskeleton while arthropods have an exoskeleton. Um, and because of that, um, arthropods need to molt, which means they need to uh, discard their old shell and grow a new one. Uh, every time they they grow in size or when there's not enough space in their old shell. So that's why when you go to the beach and you see those really nice uh, crab shells that clearly doesn't have a crab or any organism within it, um, that's because that crab has molted his old shell and grew a new one. Uh, so here are some small crustaceans that you can see in the ocean. Um, you have copepods, which is the top image on the right-hand side there. Uh, they are planktonic, so they're very small, uh, hard to see without a microscope. Um, and they are a, a very big food source for a lot of organisms in the ocean. Uh, next, you have barnacles. That's the second image down. And they are sessile, which means they uh, don't move around for the majority of their lifetime. Uh, and they do uh, cement themselves onto rocks, boats, uh, or whales, organisms. You know, they'll, they'll attach themselves to anything that's really slow moving or doesn't move at all. 
Uh, they are filter feeders and they have uh, these modified legs that uh, look like fans almost and they're known as Siri and they stick them out and um, filter out any food in the in the water column so that they can uh, so they can eat. Next you have your amphipods uh, they are curved and flattened sideways so if, uh, if you think of a fish how it's flattened sideways um, that's that's the same thing that's happening with this amphipod here that's that third image right there so it basically looks like a small little shrimp um, but it's not really a shrimp uh, but it's very similar uh, they can they these creatures are microscopic too uh, next you would have isopods isopods are parasitic and they are dorsal dorsal ventrally flattened so think of like your flounder your flounder is dorsal ventrally flattened so instead of the amphipod which is flattened on the sides uh, isopods are flattened from the top and bottom um, and in the, in the fourth image there you can see isopods they are attached to that red fish um, they are those purpley looking dots um, and they and they feed off of that fish so it's, it's not a good thing uh, and then lastly you have krill krill are shrimp like plankton um, and they're they're pretty much preyed upon by whales and fish and uh, other birds and whatnot um, so it's kind of ironic that the largest uh, animal on the planet feeds on the smallest one of the smallest animals on the planet Okay, so uh, these uh, shrimps, lobsters, and crabs in particular are known as decapods because they have 10 legs. So deca means 10, pod uh, means leg. So it, it, if you can see there uh, in the image on the bottom, you can see in the cephalothorax um, where the carapace is at, uh, you have four of those smaller legs with what are known as parapods um, and those are your walking legs so there's four on each side so that's eight and then you've got your two claws on either side you've got a, a crusher claw and a pincher claw um, so the, those are that's two so you've got eight plus two which is ten um, the not all um, lobsters and crabs or shrimps will have a crusher claw and a pincher claw. Some of them will have both pinchers or some of them will have both crushers. It just depends on the species. Um, but all of them will have two claws that they use to uh, grab their prey with and then they have uh, eight walking legs. Um, they all have some sort of carapace which is just the, the, the head where the head shell basically then you have the abdomen, which is uh, usually incorporates the tails and any flippers. Flippers? Yeah, flippers. Um, and let's see, what else? Oh, and the antenna. All of them will have antenna, and some of them will have um, little feeler uh, feelers. Uh, sometimes their arms, like crabs, will have little feeler arms in front of their mouth to help bring the food closer to them. Um, but some of them will have like mini antenna basically in front of their mouth so they they can feel what's going on uh let's see what else three they have three pairs of maxipilles oh yeah yeah that that's those little feelers in front of their mouth um maxi ma maxilli pads and uh they they use those to grab the food and move it towards their mouth um all shrimps lobsters and crabs are uh scavengers so they are different from deposit feeders but they're similar in the sense that they will anything that is laying on the ocean floor that's say dead or dying or rotting they will eat it so in the sense if you've ever heard of the saying that uh, shrimps lobsters and crabs are the cockroaches of the ocean eh, it's, it's, I mean, they're in the same family, uh, they're in the same phylum, 
Uh, but they definitely taste a lot better than cockroaches. That's for sure. Uh, let's see. So here is a compound microscope image of the head of a shrimp. And what you can see there is those little hairs. Those are the, um, those are used to like feel and, um, sense things in the water. Uh, you can see the antenna that extend below uh, the eyes. Um, so arthropods have complex eyes, uh, or com I should say compound eyes. So they, they're not like human eyes. Human eyes are not compound eyes. Um, if you think of when you see a fly and they have uh, multiple facets, to that eye, that, and that's what a compound eye is. So that eye right there, all of those little blue and purple balls make up its eye and it can see out of each ball, unlike ours where we just have one eye in each socket and they work together. And this one, they have multiple, you imagine having multiple eyes within your socket that can all see and then register something back. These compound eyes are light sensitive, so they don't really uh, show you a picture like our eyes do, but they can uh, are pretty good at sensing uh, differences in in light uh, concentrations. Uh, let's see. Oh, okay. Uh, the open circulatory system absorbs nutrients uh, directly from the uh, stomach, and, which is where digestion occurs. So unlike your jellyfish and your uh, polyps and whatnot uh, that do digestion, that start digestion outside of the body, all of the digestion uh, uh, occurs within the body for arthropods. Okay, and reproduction. So... Uh, decopods have to mate after the female molts, so after she gets rid of her old shell because she has to make room for the eggs. Uh, females will carry the eggs on the underside of her body. So the two examples down there, the lobster on the left hand side is carrying those um, eggs, they're black eggs, um, and there's probably uh, a, a thousand. Yeah, maybe not a thousand. Okay, maybe hundreds. Okay, maybe maybe I'm like overestimating here. Um, but definitely that lobster has a hundred, a hundreds of eggs, if not a thousand, uh, little eggs uh, hidden underneath her tail there, and um, she uses those back legs to uh, push water over them so that they stay oxygenated, and uh, once they are ready to hatch, they just pop out of the eggs and start floating away. Um, they will be plankton initially. They go through a number of different stages of plankton before they become adults. Um, that crab on the right hand side there, that orange um, lump under, under her um, body, that's where all of her eggs are at. So um, that V-shaped Part of her shell that is a uh, covering part of her eggs that's how you can tell she's a female because she actually has to uh, open up that part of her body to make room for all of those eggs if you look at a male crab um, male crab underside uh, you can see that uh, it's not that nice mountain shape it's more of a very sharp peak so there, there's differences. You can tell the difference between a male and female, basically. And let's see, some other arthropods that are worth noting. Uh, we have horseshoe crabs. Um, they are similar to nautilus in the sense that they are known as living fossils because uh, since who knows how long, but eons, um, nautilus and Horseshoe crabs have not evolved. Uh, very similar to sharks too. A lot of species of sharks have not evolved. Um, so they are the same uh, 
in which they were a uh, really long time ago. Uh, sea spiders, so horseshoe crabs is that top image. Sea spiders are the uh, middle image right there. They are typically found in colder waters and they look like a daddy long legs, but in the water. Uh, but they, they're not poisonous, but I don't think they offer much nutrition either. So I, I wouldn't go trying to eat one. Uh, let me know if you know of anybody who's tried one, but I doubt you can eat them. Um, and then you can also have uh, marine insects. So these typically will be scavengers that are close to shore. Uh, uh, much like that. Uh, how, what do they call those things now? Like water skippers, I think they're called. Uh, but essentially, just they just kind of float uh, on top of the water. It almost looks like they're walking on top of the water. Um, um, but that's because their surface area to volume is greater. So that allows them to just hang out on top of the water and squirt, squirt, uh, squirt, skirt around, basically. Okay, so that was arthropods. Uh, next, we will talk about lophophorates. Uh, these guys are different from uh, cnidarians. They, they kind of look like a mix between a polyp and a worm, uh, but they are uh, suspension feeders. So they have to extend their uh, tentacles out into the water column and they have to pick out the food that they need from the water. They don't have any segmentation in their body um, and they, they do have uh, bilateral symmetry unlike uh, worms. Worms have radial symmetry. Well, some of them. Some of them have radial symmetry. No, take it back. They have bilateral symmetry too. Um, but similar to worms, they have a coelom, which is uh, similar to a body cavity, and they have a U-shaped gut. Uh, so in this case, though, these lophophorates uh, live in the sediment. So majority of their body will be in the sediment, and the only time they will pop up above the in the ground will be to get some food. So some types of lophophorates are bryozoans. So that top image right there kind of just looks like a, a blob of goo, but it actually is a colony of lophophorates. So if you see this in the ocean, don't freak out. Um, it's not going to attack you. It's not going to eat you. Don't worry. Uh, it, it's just a... It's just a loaf of four, right? Uh, the next one there is a, uh, darn, I hate words like this, foranids, foranids maybe. It's a worm-like, uh, it's worm-like worm and it, it builds tubes within the sediment. And as you can see there, it's extending its tentacle gill-like structure out into the water column because it needs to... Uh, uh, do uh, suspension feeding. And then lastly, you have your uh, lamp shells. Um, these ones, I guess, in a sense, kind of look like lamps, um, but they also burrow into the sediment and they will open up their shell. So unlike the foranids, uh, they have a shell on the top. And so they open up their shell, extend their gill-like structures up, and uh, and do suspension feeding. Uh, next, uh, you have echinoderms. So echinoderms are your uh, sea urchins and your uh, what is it called now? Sea cucumbers. Uh, and so these particular um, organisms have radial symmetry. So they're a little bit different um, from the other ones. Uh, and they do have a, a plankton larvae stage uh, when they're when they're really small, and then when they turn into adults, uh, they they become uh, then they become adults after they go through a number of stages in the larvae. But interestingly enough, their larvae have bilateral symmetry, and then once they become adults, it turns into uh, radial symmetry. Um, 
let's see, they they have what's known as a pentam pentamerous radial symmetry, which means it can only be uh, cut into five parts. So like a starfish, for instance. Uh, so unlike your jellyfish, uh, you can't just keep cutting them up and get equal parts. You can only cut it up into five parts. Uh, they have an endoskeleton, so very similar to humans. Um, the tissue, uh, if you were to look at a sea urchin, uh, there's actually tissue on the outside of the skeleton that um, that protects the skeleton. Uh, it's unlike, uh, it's very different from the arthropods. Uh, they use a water vascular system, so they use water to move um, everything around, uh, and they have tube feet to walk around on. So, uh, they, uh, I'll, I'll, I think I'll show you, I think I have an example for you on the next slide of what tube feet look like, uh, but they're basically just little suckers that attach to the rocks or whatever it is, and they use that to move around. Uh, they have what's known as a mad, Madroporite, madroporite. I hate English. Um, and this connects the vascular system with the surrounding ocean. So it's basically a pore that is in the shell that lets water into um, the organism. So some types of echinoderms that you can find in the ocean. Uh, you can find sea stars, uh, which have a oral and aboral side. The aboral side, which you can see in the image on the top there, uh, have what's known as pedicellaria, uh, and these are just little pinchers on, on the top of the starfish there that helps keep uh, the, the starfish from growing algae on top of it. Uh, so that's really interesting. And then the second one is brittle stars. So these are slightly different from your uh, starfish, uh, but uh, they also use tube feet uh, to move around and to feed. Um, brittle stars typically uh, come out at nighttime, so they're nocturnal versus uh, sea stars, which are just out there all the time. Uh, then you have sea urchins that graze on algae and have spines, so some of them are poisonous. So that really big black urchin that you guys see with really long spines, don't touch that. That's very poisonous. <laughs> you, you, that, that sting will definitely hurt. Um, versus the urchin that you see there, uh, that one's probably not too poisonous. Uh, it'll still hurt if you step on it uh, because you'll get spines in your foot, but it, it won't have uh, a toxic effect to it. Uh, you, you can see that sea cucumber right there. Uh, that sea cucumber is a deposit feeder, so it eats on junk that's on the on the ocean floor. Um, interestingly enough, uh, sea cucumbers and starfish uh, can have uh, the ability to regenerate parts of themselves, which, oh yeah, I talk about in the next slide. Okay, so I'll leave that for the next slide. Um, and then you have um, crinoids, which is the last one there, and those are suspension feeders, um, but they are echinoderms, even though they look uh, a lot like, uh, say, a worm or whatnot. So um, echinoderms can, uh, some species, can extend their stomach out and digest uh, whatever prey that they're going for um, using some enzymes. So for instance, the sea cucumber, that's what the sea cucumber does. It, it extends its stomach out, grabs onto its prey, starts digesting the prey outside of its body, and then once it gets to a point, it can bring it back in and, for, and complete the digestion process. Uh, nutrients are transferred into the uh, coelomic uh, fluid, and so uh, that's the fluid within the body cavity itself, and so nutrients from the stomach go directly into that fluid. Uh, they do have a nervous net similar to jellyfish, but they don't have a brain, so not like octopus. And these uh, these species have separate sex 
sexes, so they, or genders, I should say, so they, they don't have hermaphrodites um, in this phylum. And some species like your uh, sea cucumber and your starfish can regenerate part of their body. So for instance, if you were to cut a starfish in half and throw it back into the ocean, uh, you have now just created two starfish, which is pretty interesting. Uh, funny story though, uh, in San Francisco, back in the day, they were having a real big problem with starfish. So they decided to cut a bunch of starfish in half, throw them back into the ocean, and they made the problem worse. Uh, sea cucumbers, on the other hand, uh, the only part that can be regenerated is their stomach. So our stomach and intestines. So, oh no, I'm sorry, it's intestines. So if they get threatened by a predator, what they'll do is they'll spit out their intestines hope that the predator gets confused and attacks the intestines instead of uh, the organism itself and hopefully it's satisfied with just getting the intestines that it can let the sea cucumber uh, get away. Now granted they don't move very fast so um, yeah. And lastly, you have hemichordates. So um, hemichordates are similar to, are, are basically thought to be the missing link between chordates and the other groups of organisms. Because how do you go from an invertebrate to a, a vertebrate all of a sudden, right? So hemichordates um, have lar larval stages um, that are similar to echinoderms. Uh, they do have a nerve cord um, that is similar to uh, chordates. So they, they do have like a nervous cord basically, right? Um, but it's not enclosed within uh, a solid spinal structure like humans are. An example of hemichordates are acorn worms. They are uh, deposit feeders and they are found uh, near hydrothermal vents. And so that's an example of an acorn worm uh, in the image there. All right, and then you actually have chordates that don't have a backbone. So you have, these are, these are what's known as protochordates and they lack a backbone, a solid backbone. They do have a nerve cord and a notochord. So this is a notochord is similar to a backbone, but it's flexible. So it wouldn't be classified as a backbone because a backbone really is not flexible. Uh, even though in humans, our spinal cord can bend and move, but that's because each joint is, is separate and can bend. But, uh, uh, but overall, if you look at the individual joints, they, they are not flexible. Uh, tunicates, which is the bottom left-hand image there, uh, they have a tadpole-like larvae, uh, and they are responsible for uh, biofouling on boats. So they have uh, a nasty habit of making a home on, on boats. And then the right-hand image there is a lancet, which um, is a filter feeder and likes to live on, on like sand, for instance. That's what I mean by soft bottoms. All right, so this was chapter seven. Uh, I apologize, it was kind of a long chapter, um, but there are a lot of invertebrates out in the ocean. All right, so uh, we will talk about chapter eight next week, which is on fishes.